In terms of government financing, let's talk about the problems first. Council Form, the financing problems? Well, it's, it's you know, we're, we're running this country off of, uh, you know, an arrangement which was created before electricity was invented. At, at some point, you revisit, you know, the structure of this country and you adapt the platform for the next century, not, not two centuries previous. Mm -hmm. So cities were created as creatures of the province, as it's like to be described. Um, cities weren't the economic engine that they are now. They weren't the, the place where ideas uh, came to, 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 to collide and, and create value to, to manufacturing or, or resource extraction processes. Uh, cities have changed, and, and society has changed. And as a result of that, um, the, the obligations that have been either downloaded or self-selected by the city, the, the, the social dynamics that, that create opportunity and challenges in urban areas, um, no longer can, can simply be run off a simple tax known as the property tax. We need to rethink, we need to rethink how we generate wealth so we can rethink how we harness that wealth so we can reinvest to sustain that process. And, and that thinking uh, is locked in a, in a constitutional debate uh, between the provinces and, and the federal government that leaves us at the sidelines. And all cities across this country are struggling no matter how well or badly they're managed. Their, their, their challenges aren't matched with their revenue streams. Toronto, um, in comparison to a lot of other cities, uh, is the envy of a lot of other cities because we've managed to elevate the debate in society, mm -hmm. largely done in the last years of Mel Laspin and the first years of David Miller, where, where we created a national dialogue about fixing the financial structures of cities. And that's where the new revenues that are now flowed to the city have come. Yeah. Should Toronto keep or lose the vehicle registration tax? You keep it. Should you keep or lose the land transfer tax? You keep it. Should you fix property tax? You must. But at the end of the day, if we don't create a, 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 a city with, with the resources we're given, and if that city doesn't generate the resources back to sustain it, uh, we're not going anywhere. And so we need to take a look at this, at our government structures and our revenues and our expenditures and make smart decisions. But we also need to keep our eye on the ball. And the eye on the ball is around creating a strong, vibrant city. Because as, as you, can, you can say very quickly, uh, you can build a city and you will get an economy. If you build an economy, you don't necessarily end up with a good city. And, and economics are just balance sheets. And balance sheets don't do it. But a great city does it all the time. And, and the challenge in front of Toronto right now is how do we get back to city building? get away from these, these, these penny-ante debates, quite frankly, about, about you know, 1.25% or 1.26% tax hikes as if, as if that's the crux of the matter. How do we make sure that our housing is better, that our transit works, that our water is clean, that our streets are safe, and that economic vitality is present while all of this happens? That's what's in front of us. And the debates we've been having at City Hall, quite frankly, on the, on the, the headline level, uh, you know, are just not there. But the conversations that are happening in, in neighborhoods about, about how to fix these little problems and how to reinvest and create wealth that can be regenerated and create more wealth that can, that can create you know, sort of a sustainable local economy or sustainable housing model or sustainable parks model or sustainable library system, those conversations have been really fruitful and we're starting to see the benefits of that and that's why the surplus is materializing. But here's the thing, you, you don't have to go back a hundred years. Uh, there's an economist in town, Hugh McKenzie, that's, that's actually been tracking investment of all orders of government in, in cities, and particularly the, the, the big five cities of Ontario, since 1955. He went back as far as 55, and he's tracked them all the way to 2005, just to, to show us what's the 50-year picture. And think back now. We were all tiny little kids in 1955, but cities felt strong. This was a very, this city felt like a strong city, Toronto the good. And in those days, where you, if you graph the investment of other governments, what you'll see in, in Hugh's graph, a very credible economist in Canada, is federal investment in cities, building cities, getting them off the ground, making us a world power, federal investment up here. You'll find the province in about the middle. And because we had that one vehicle, the property tax, uh, from which to collect money, here we were down here, the city making sure of day-to-day -day operations. But the big investment to, to build that strong city was happening up here at the federal level. Over those 50 years, the city's line has gone up here. The federal line has gone right down here. And the province just coasted along in the middle. I don't have an issue with the provincial investment in, in, uh, in uh, 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 the City of Toronto right now. It's at about 25% of our budget, and that's about the same as any American city.
Their state governments are putting about 25% in. But the federal government in, in, in any American city that's, uh, that's building its way back right now is a damn sight more than the 2% that the federal government is putting into to Toronto's budget right now. That's the difference between 1955 and now, is if you want that strong city, and especially if, if we're talking about the engine of the whole nation, then everybody better be investing in it. Um, the mayor of Chicago, and Rahm Emanuel has, has, has attacked the, the analysis from a different perspective. He's shown that when the, when, when the, the, the investment in infrastructure, which there's a massive deficit right across North America, we've been cutting deficit, we cut, we've been fighting the deficit by cutting our infrastructure investments uh, as a continent now for the better part of the last 20 years. It has shrunk from a, from a sort of a standard of 4% of the GDP down to about 2%. And while these sounds like sort of, you know, statistical numbers that, that only economists could, could really salivate in over states. in the States. Right. What, what, what happened is, is when they cut that investment, economic growth dropped to the level of infrastructure investment. What they're finding is, is that they start to invest in infrastructure and they get it back up closer to the 4% of GDP. The economic growth tracks it. And what's interesting about this, and this is the argument that, that Emmanuel has made to, to, to his council and to the city and the city has embraced, is that when you make this investment in infrastructure, it gets paid back. Public investment. Public yeah. investment. It gets paid, and you, you can also harness it with private partnership in, in the states in this model. But when you do it, what happens is, is that the taxes that, that, uh, that, that, that are benefited or that, that, are, that, that, that are generated, sorry, by, by this investment uh, create the wealth that actually replenish the federal government and provincial government coffers. They can actually manage the investment and the return on investment as, as a cash flow entity. And, and so mm -hmm. they, are, they are making the pitch to, to Washington and Springfield and Illinois that this is possible. It's fallen on deaf ears. There's, there's big deficits running those governments. And what they've done is they've started their own infrastructure bank and they've got their own private investment firms in Chicago putting money in, much like a bond float, but putting money into an mm -hmm. infrastructure bank as Chicago puts all of its cash resources in. They're generating this investment fund and they're plowing it straight back into roads and bridges and transit and housing and they're growing the economy. They're adding 30,000 jobs over the next five years out of this process of, of investing in infrastructure which in itself creates the, 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 the platform for the economic growth which returns the tax, mm -hmm. the tax dollars back to government. It's, it's, a, it's a different, it's a stimulative, it's a different mm -hmm. way of doing stimulation. It's actually what but Canada it can did in 2009 and it's why our recovery has been more steady much faster than the United States because that is actually what we did through the work of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities forcing Stephen Harper, let us do public infrastructure builds and we will use private partnerships to do it. But let us drive it through through city infrastructure. Don't just shove it all out there to private entities and, and have them pay it out in bonuses. A lot of it went to cities. Cities put some of their own local money into it. We were happy to get the stimulus funds, but your, your property tax paid for, for, for the other half of the cost of that project. But that public investment allowed us to make sure we had accountable partnerships and we actually got the projects done and actually got the jobs out there on the ground. But underneath it all, they actually did learn something from their stimulus investment that they did immediately after the global financial crisis. Because while that fund is about to wind down and supposedly the money dry, might dry up for cities, in fact what they learned from it is maybe they should be investing in cities. And so as that fund ends, we are right now working with other cities on, in mm -hmm. 2014, a new permanent and ongoing infrastructure stimulus account that, get, that, that cities are, are meant to go to. They simply want us to work out between now and then the terms. How will we decide what you're allowed to invest, in, invest it in? So they may say that and give the firm hand. Uh, it doesn't really fit their narrative right now to admit that that investment was a good thing and is keeping uh, jobs on the ground, but they seem to be responding to it. It's funny, the federal bureaucrats and federal ministers, and when you talk to Jim Flaherty, you get the same conversation. One of the things they found through the stimulus program was that municipal governments were better at getting the money to the private sector than other companies, other private sector partners were. So if they, if they said that there were different stimulus programs, mm -hmm. if there was a stimulus program that, that, that was meant to, to, to make flush the auto industry, yeah. that money didn't get circulated back into the economy as quickly as if they'd given the same amount of money to, to local government, and and there's some interesting reasons for that. The, the, you know, the, the, if you take a look at what happened to a lot of corporate balance sheets when they had access to to, to government-provided uh, capital, they banked it. 
They begged it for a rainy day. They, they thought that the market would drop and they'd buy later, but they, they, they kind of hoarded the money and got very cautious and, 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 and were afraid in, in, in maybe understandable ways to, 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 to take chances. Local government, and this is true right across the country, it's, it's, not, just a, it's just not peculiar to Toronto, local government took the opportunity of the one-time funding and immediately dispersed it into the economy, getting bridges built and hiring and partnering with private sector companies to do it, getting housing built and pu- partnering with private sector companies to get it doing to keep the real estate market moving, keep the trades active in their communities so that when the private sector did have an opportunity to build, the, the, the labour market was there to respond to the private sector market demands. This is interesting information. Uh, because what, what it shows is, is, that, is that there are ways to stimulate the economy that circulate the money, and there are ways to stimulate the economy that pools the money. And the pooling of money is, 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 what, is what creates a context for speculation in a way that, that, that circulating the money doesn't. And so when they say they're not interested in evidence-based uh, uh, findings, I don't think that's true. I think, that, I think they watched the evidence very carefully. What they're nervous about is, is that the deficit in infrastructure is so magnificent, they could suck all the money out of the federal government if they're not careful, and that leaves the federal government unable to respond to a whole series of other issues, which are their priorities, which are driven not necessarily by what's good for the economy, but what's perhaps good for the electoral success of the party in the next cycle. And so we're in a very strange period of time right now where, where sometimes you don't do the right thing to get reelected. Because there's only so much politicians can do to wreck a city, and there's only so much politicians can do to create a great city. In the end, cities create themselves, and that's the, that's the genius and the beauty of, of what they are. What we can, however, uh, capitalize on in the city is the fact that we like talking about Toronto. It, it's, it's one of the few cities where the conversation never stops. It's a constant conversation about what's working, what's not working, why is it working, why isn't it working, what can be done to fix it. And that's the dialogue that needs to be sustained in the city to create a truly great livable city. The other things, the inventions that'll, that'll move us along, the, the, you know, the way Kensington Market becomes a market, the way th- that the peanut becomes a cultural hub, the way that, that, uh, that the kids in Malvern start to solve their problems because they're the ones that are, at the end of the day, going to have to take responsibility and de- deal with it. That government can help sort of uh, provide the, 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 the catalyst for. Mm-hmm. The topic of tonight's conversation is, is, is about how we create... Um, in my mind, a decentralized government, how we create pockets of ingenuity and, and innovation and, and, and f- financial dynamic in, these, in each one of these neighborhoods and knit them together as a city. That's the big city building project. Connect it with transit, yes. Make sure there's, there's equity in housing, absolutely. Make sure there's access to education, a fundamental, an absolute fundamental. But if we don't do those things, if, if what we do is talk about tax points, or talk about whether or not the surplus is generated through a, through a revenue, structural revenue you know, sort of surplus or a, or, a, or a chronic underfunding imbalance with the federal... If all we do is have debate economics for the rest of our lives and stop talking about the city, the city will cease to be livable. And in fact, it is all about, as Adam says, it's about the dialogue. The dialogue is happening right now. Maybe not in the mayor's office, but it is happening right now. The issue is this, is that, is that it's time we grew up, and I agree that Ottawa and Queen's Park could do better, and they should do better, and you as voters should make them do better, and we as Canadians ought to think about doing better. But in the interim, I'm not going to sit here and whine about fo- the federal government and the provincial government. I will put the pressure I can on them. But in the interim, let's get to work making Toronto a better place and, 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 and being honest about the fact that if Ottawa and Queen's Park are going to pull the money out of the city and make us poor that we're going to have to stuff it back down their throats by making ourselves the best city, by ourselves, for ourselves. And that, res- that requires a civic dialogue and about excellence, not about the lowest common denominator, not about how much money you can save in your office budget if you don't buy coffee, not, not about who wears the Easter Bunny Parade. Thing. Is this neighbourhood working? Are we in charge of the planning process? Are we delivering the services we need? Are those services getting better? Are we answering telephone calls? Is the political structure that we're living with fixable? Can we decentralize this decision making and this debate into the pockets of the city that are solving problems and drive those solutions to the rest of the city? That's the conversation that transforms Toronto, not a court case in Ottawa, and quite frankly, not bitching and whining about whether the mayor paid 50 cents or 75 cents on his transit token in Chicago and whether that was taxpayer supported. That is a pointless conversation. Getting the city working again 
is a valuable conversation. Mm -hmm.